Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and once every two years, we take a week off. Uh, this week we're going to be covering two new albums from two artists we're going to be talking about the latest release from uh i i would say that uh, most of the podcast really actually does care for miss olsen's music so a uh, podcast favorite artist angel olsen's new album big time uh unrelated to peter gabriel i think we're also going to be talking about the latest album from forgotten suicide squad character post malone his new album 12 carat toothache yeah, he was the guy that had the ropes and his head blew up in like the first scene right uh, yes yeah, that's not right. the man who can climb anything <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the one that's i haven't thought about that in so long <laughs> anyway <laughs> as jake alluded to we took a week off, uh, a much needed one, I would say, but we are back to regularly. The Sigma grind program. set, don't stop. Except, Except for when it does. It. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And all four of us are back for today's main episode where we're going to be talking about those albums that Jake mentioned. Also, uh, as per usual on Tuesday, we'll have a record club on Depeche Mode's Songs of Faith and Devotion. Plus, we will have the, I'm sure there are some people out there who've been waiting for it with bated breath, breath. The continuation Bated Beth. <laughs> the continuation of our Bureauk retrospective with Biophilia on Thursday as well. But before all that, let's get into what we've been listening to for the past two weeks. Uh, Jake, what have you been listening to? I actually have listened to a fair bit of new shit this week. The first of which is, I guess, I have found myself at a, a, a low enough point that I've decided, hey, you know what I should do is I should go back into the catalog of Lingua Ignata, um, a musician who I love. But uh, as I've said before, it's like her, her album, Caligula is an album I adore. I love that album. It's also an album that makes me feel like shit. Uh, because it's insanely dark and depressing. But uh, I didn't go back and re-listen to that one, but I did re-listen to Sinner Get Ready a little bit just because that's, you know, one of our favorite albums of last year. It's a good one to sort of uh, kind of dig deep into upon re-listen. But I finally went back and re-listened to her first album, which is sort of the first uh, record in this sort of trilogy with Sinner Get Ready and Caligula, which is All Bitches Die, immaculate name. Um, and I mean, unsurprisingly, I found this to be pretty fucking terrific. Uh, it's honestly a lot more measured than I expected. I sort of heard that it was a little bit more like primitive by comparison. And that is true. It's not as, I guess, thoughtful as Sinner Get Ready. And it's not quite as uh, deliberate or concise as Caligula it is just kind of brutal and noisy it's a little bit like lower fi than those records it's got our like a real roughness and edge to it it's certainly the weakest in the trilogy just because I feel like Kristen was still sort of honing her sound and style and would refine it to better effect on the following two records but I don't want to diminish this particular album just because it feels like an integral part of the narrative of these records and the narrative of Kristen as an artist. So if you were a fan of Caligular Center, get ready and haven't checked this one out, just because it is significantly less popular than those two, I'd highly recommend it. It's totally a worthwhile venture. Um, I also listened to her EP, uh, The Heart of Man, uh, which is, I think, something that basically, it's interesting to see how she sort of constructs albums. I think she sort of has segments of songs and then we'll sort of like stitch things together and like create a more cohesive narrative from like song ideas she's playing around with just because this EP has a bunch of material that would go on to be on Sinner Get Ready but it is resequenced a lot of the uh, songs have different titles and a lot of them are just like segments of different songs it still works on its own as an EP kind of experience uh, you sort of hear like the, the first bit of uh, Pennsylvania Furnace at the end of this, uh, but it's called Everything Burns instead. But a worthwhile venture nonetheless. I really want to check out more of her stuff just because I've been taking a more conceited effort to look into EPs lately, just because I'm working on a personal project of mine that has to do with EPs. Um, so I also want to listen to like her Agnes Day EP and what have you, cool stuff. And I guess on sort of tangential on a sort of like 
neoclassical dark wave adjacent thing is that I finally, after years of just not re-listening to this for whatever reason, finally went and re-listened to another favorite of, I know a couple people on the podcast, which is Anna Von Housewolf's Dead Magic. Uh, I listened to this album a while ago when uh, a little bit past when it first came out and I loved it and then just didn't revisit it. And we've actually covered uh, her most recent album on the podcast, uh, All Thoughts Fly. And I wasn't really big into that. So I guess that just didn't really like incentivize me going back to re-listen to her stuff. So then I went and re-listened to it. Fuck. That's a good fucking album. Jesus Christ. I love that thing. It's, I mean, like every production choice on that album is positively marvelous. The organ work on there is just ecstatic. I love her vocal presence. Everything on there is just so dense. Like it's impossible to even like label this under one particular genre. Like, you know, you want to call it neoclassical dark wave. And I would say that that's probably the closest thing. Like Anna von Housel's music is basically the closest thing to a modern successor to like Dead Can Dance, like much closer than uh, Lingua Ignata, I think. Um, but it's also like there are moments on there where it's like jazz fusion. It's, it's just, it's an immaculate, really, really compelling record. And it's also like, it's only like six tracks long. And it's like 35 minutes. It's like the perfect length. It's really dynamic. It's really tight. I fucking, it was just really good to revisit something that I remember being incredibly impressed by and liking it even more than I remember liking it. Uh, this, I guess it's my turn uh, when it comes to, I feel like everyone, Sersha sort of knocked over the dominoes when she was on the show. And then eventually it landed on Riley where last year got real, real into the mountain goats. Now it's my turn. Um, I sort of have gone back to listen to like basically every, I want to prepare for Bleed Out properly and just listen to like every Cannon Mountain Goats album, um, including the ones that I've like listened to in the past and, and really liked because I want to get like a proper sort of grasp on their discography. I went back and watched Sersha's uh, Worst to Best on them as well. Go check that out if you're even slightly interested. But I listened to a couple canonical ones that I hadn't listened to before. I listened to The Life of the World to Come. I listened to The Sunset Tree. I listened to We Shall All Be Healed, uh, all of which I love. They're, to various degrees, uh, I listened to all of them multiple times just because that sort of post-Tallahassee like immediate era of records is where John Darnielle's writing becomes really, really kind of, part of me wants to say obtuse, but I, I don't really think that's the right word for it. There, there's something distinctly like, I would almost say it's like Dylan-esque. There, there's something very oblique about it, but it still remains directly compelling, even if you can't immediately identify why, which is why albums like The Life of the World to Come and We Shall All Be Healed are like albums that I would say like necessitate re-listens to fully comprehend and understand them, both because you want to get what the album is about and understand what it is, and because it's immensely rewarding to do so. Um, and of the those kind of records, I found We Shall All Be Healed to be a really compelling experience just because that's a really interesting portrait of John's youth when he was uh, addicted to both, I think, heroin and methamphetamines and the sort of like people and scenes that he like ran with and the kind of life that he lived and the kind of people that he was around. Like the perspective, the, the title of it, We Shall All Be Healed is kind of telling just because all of the songs on that album feel like they're told from the perspective of like a small group of people. Uh, there's like, you know, the pronoun we is more commonly used than I or you. Uh, th there's lots of really great songs on here. I think the best part of discovering uh, these albums for the first time is sort of noting just how much they take advantage of the studio and the band sound sort of, you know, post All Hail West Texas is that they managed to like insert a lot of ideas in terms of like folk music and indie folk music that feels in keeping with the genre, but also really texturally fascinating stuff that like basically just like it takes you off guard just because you don't really expect something like this uh on first listen of just like oh hey it's like a normal mountain goats album and then like there'll be these weird string swells on a song and you'll be like whoa 
didn't expect that didn't see that coming mm -hmm. um and yeah there's a couple other albums i need to check out still um i still want to re-listen to stuff like heretic pride just to nail down what my favorite mountain goats album is um but currently uh th this is like the least surprising thing ever is that right now i think my favorite mountain goats album you you could probably if you're familiar with the band you will probably be able to guess this instantly and that my favorite album from them right now i think is the sunset tree there we go and i wanted to have a better answer than that just because i feel like it, it feels safe and it also just feels like Again, it's just like, what a typically Jake answer. It's like, of course, the most emotionally forthright uh, mm -hmm. Mountain Goats album is his favorite. But I really do think that there's something in the way that John's writing had elevated since West Texas and how it was like right on the precipice of being that more literary songwriting stuff that he would go on to do on We Shall All Be Healed or, you know, that kind of stuff. But the direct emotionality of him talking about his childhood, because The Sunset Tree is primarily an album that is also, it's actually dedicated to John's uh, stepfather, who was an abusive alcoholic. And the entire album is about song, like songs from his childhood, dealing with and reckoning with that. I remember getting to the song Dance Music, which I already had a, a siren go off in my head just because of the uh, Frightened Rabbit si side project dance music. And I was just oh, like, Oh, yeah, I never made that connection. I wonder, mm, is this going to be the same kind of shit? And lo and behold, it was just like, Here's an upbeat and spry song about my stepdad hitting my mom. And it's like, Oh, God damn it. But yeah, there's, there's so many great songs on there, like Love, 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 Immaculate immaculate top five mountain goat songs um this year of course an absolute classic uh, uh shout out been... shout out to a deep cut favorite of mine hast thou considered the tetrapod that song is a fucking fucking great. fantastic i mean the album is full of nothing but fantastic songs but that is that that's sort of the delight of that album is sort of seeing what it ends up being your deep cut favorite i think there's a lot of songs on the back half of that album especially that just that just fucking hit and yeah I, i'm just really compelled by that i really want to go back and listen to a bunch of other stuff but I, I i i can pretty confidently say that that's my favorite right now and i don't think anything else will will supplant it but who knows fucking mm -hmm. try me maybe another album will grow on me who knows yeah it's interesting like in that era you have i think th you have three records that i are, are like so directly personal in a way that is uh, in ways that are so uh comprehensive that john would kind of stop doing that kind of songwriting and that's of course sunset tree we should all be healed and also get lonely as well which tends to be the kind of forgotten yeah, one, one which tends to be the forgotten one in that trio but fits in i think really nicely and then after that with records like heretic pride and then even further with records like life of the world to come you're right his songwriting gets less immediately personal although it still is it's just he 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 tells stories more so than kind of recounts these sort of direct experiences but he finds this beautifully artful way of weaving those stories into the context of a wide tapestry that gives each record a sense of cohesion and like consistency of subject matter and 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 topic and theme and idea um but yeah life of the world to come is my favorite one of his just because it's so comprehensive and beautiful it's very low key and very spear and very stripped down but in a lot of ways i feel like ugh, that's just a record that just fucks me up in so many different ways and it just completely undoes me and um but also my second favorite would probably be we should all be healed just because i think that's the one of those early records that resonates with me the most but yeah, God, so many. I think I made uh, Life uh, of the World to Come a record club uh, for later in the year. Because... That's a really that's a really good choice. I, I'm not as fond of the Life of the World to Come as a lot of the records that it's sort of sandwiched between, but that just sort of makes it more interesting to talk about. I, I just, I think I find the disparity between how interesting I find the lyrical content and how interesting I find the musical content to be the the only thing holding me kind of at arm's length with it. Not that it's like musically bad or anything. It's just that like the songwriting is like God mode shit the entire time. And musically it's just kind of really good. 
So, I mean, it doesn't really hit those consistent highs for me, but that kind of makes it more interesting to explore. And who knows, maybe it'll grow on me. I know that that album is the dictionary definition of a grower. For um, sure. It, and like I said, it's one of the most kind of stripped back and low key records. Like a lot of it is just piano or guitar. Uh, and also, I know you're going to do this anyway, but absolutely make sure you watch the Ryan Johnson recorded uh, oh. live performance of that as well. It's on I YouTube, mean, I think. Gotta, it's not hard to find. Gotta rep my boy Ryan. Gotta yeah. rep my boy Ryan. That, um, that, that like, yeah, he's just, yeah, the hit, that's, that's a fucking great, uh, great thing. I think the reason I elected to listen to the Mountain Goats is because, uh, again, Depression Playlist, uh, Frightened Rabbit is sort of an, a band that I listen to that has sort of like a similar headspace. And I listen to like the winter of mixed drinks and painting of a panic attack mm-hmm. a couple of times. And so that was sort of like orbiting. Uh, but one thing that has nothing to do with that uh, is um, the, you, people might be aware, familiar with the fact that uh, Kate Bush has really been popular lately because of the new season of Stranger Things, a particular needle drop in that show has suddenly like really skyrocketed a lot of her like Spotify streams and stuff. And a lot of people are like, just, you know, she's just being talked about a lot. And I'm like, you know, I really do need to just finally settle it because I've, I've had this sort of war internally with me ever since I got into Kate Bush last year of just being like, I don't know what my favorite Kate Bush album is because it's either The Sensual World or Hounds of Love. I don't know which one. Um, and there are still a lot of Kate Bush albums I can't, I haven't heard yet. Uh, like a, like two or three like really canonical ones that I need to revisit. So I was just like, all right, I'm going to do a back-to-back list and I'm going to finally definitively come down on it. And I listened to Hounds of Love and The Sensual World and I got to give it to The Sensual World. It's, it's by centimeters but I think it boils down to the fact that the central world is front to back, just full consistently of nothing but solidly incredible fucking songs with really dense instrumentation. It's just really fundamentally great shit. And not to like shit talk, like, and I'm not shit talking the second half of Hounds of Love because it's great, Um, but the sort of the ninth wave sort of piece that comprises the back half of that album is great and I really enjoy it but I would be lying if I said that I enjoy it as much as the first half of that album which again it's you know cloud bursting and fucking uh running up that hill and and it's like that that is untouchable it's unfucking touchable run of pop songs um but the central world for me is like if hounds of love just kind of continued being that first half for the entire album and it also just there's some like guitar shit on that record. It's on like Rocket's Tail for Rocket or um, uh, fucking is it Love and Anger. Is that the song? I can't remember the song title. It has something to do with anger, but my God, that shit shreds. Um, ridiculously great records. You didn't need me to tell you that, but uh, they're great. I still need to listen to shit like Ariel, but that album's long as fuck and weird as fuck. So I got to be in the right mindset to listen to it. Um, Ariel, I think we will really fuck with like that is like I think my second favorite Kate Bush record second or third the top three for me are that the dreaming and kick inside which I think doesn't mm. get enough love nowadays her, her first <laughs> album great but yeah I guess it's a pretty hot take of me to rank all three of those above hounds of love but it's what it is uh, I feel like if this is gonna start kind of stunning I feel like that's only a hot take if you're a fucking normie because it's like if you know kate bush's albums it's like there's like five of them that could conceivably be number one i mean like i i I, i'm not far off of ranking never forever above hounds of love i'll fucking do it don't fucking never challenge me that that album's fucking amazing i challenge you to okay i fucking do it done you've been called out bitch um uh and i that was easy uh to oh to top things off i will say i'll shout out some kentucky rep real quick first of all jen tossed a recommendation my way coincidentally right as i was listening to another act modern from kentucky which is really weird but uh it's a band called uh belushi speedball which wow uh welcome to kentucky (laughs) yeah exactly um and as the title implicates, uh, not a band that takes themselves remarkably seriously, but they do actually have a new release. They're like a thrashy punk band that is like, 
I, I, I don't really know how to classify them other than like really loud aggro rock music. Uh, and it's, they're really fun. Um, uh, really just like, they're again, it's like the, the new project that has like 22 minutes long, uh, the cover of which is fucking hysterical. Um, but that's a good time. Um, but the Kentucky act that I have shouted out before that I will shout out again is uh, Knocked Loose, a uh, metalcore act who I, I've been listening to a little bit more of them. I listened to their first album, Laugh Tracks, uh, at the recommendation of a uh, podcast friend, Connor, um, mainly because uh, their uh, EP from last year was my favorite uh, EP of the year, which is A Tear in the Fabric of Life, which if you haven't listened to, you fucking need to. That's 22 minutes of the best hardcore music that's come out in like the last 10 years. Like I, they're, they're, the way they down tune their guitars on that fucking album makes it sound like every riff is literally like thunder in like the most extreme, like storm warning shit ever. It, it's, it's positively ridiculous. And the lead singer's vocals makes you like actively concerned for this man because he sounds so fucking like shrill and dire but he's also like a really coherent very expressive vocalist that it's like you're, you're kind of like blown back by the extremity of his screaming but also really like you know you don't need a lyric sheet to follow along with what he's saying which is very very rare with this kind of music um their, their, their album laugh tracks is pretty good but for a 30-ish minute record I, I didn't really find it to be quite as compelling as the EP from last year I think their second album is uh, is a fair bit better frankly but it still doesn't quite get up to that mark so I'm hoping that maybe they're they're like they, they really kind of stepped it up last year there's a lot of really interesting like atmospheric stuff that they do on the album that isn't like you know they don't take time aside from the metalcore shit it's just a lot of the they just really know how to make a whole lot of what is it's seemingly a very like minimal genre and they do it in a way that I don't think any other metalcore band working right now really does. August, yeah. what have you been listening to in so, the last day? Z. Days? Okay, so first thing I'll, I'll go to uh, I, I've been listening to an album called Parallel Lines by the band uh, Blondie uh, oh. famously the band of Debbie Harry. Blondie? I, I bring them up primarily because I, I want to shout out the fact that uh, I think the actual band, like uh, it, the members beyond Debbie Harry are really, really essential to this band's sound and bringing it together because they've got such a, it, they're like a, a New York band who sounds like they're a British band is, is the best way I can describe their particular yeah. sound. <laughs> Uh, they've got a real, and I mean, it's no shock that they appealed to uh, 70s and 80s British crowds far more than American crowds. I think That's just yeah. on the basis of their sound. Uh, albums, okay, it's, it's decent. I enjoyed it. Uh, but I just wanted to say band's pretty good. I'll talk about uh, an album from uh, the Men Zingers. The Menzos, uh, on the impossible past. This was a pretty, the pretty good album. I I liked it overall. I had a enjoyable enough time with it. I really like the song Casey a ton. I think that's easily my favorite thing on there, and easily. I mean, I think the opening run of like three or four songs is also pretty solid. Some of it definitely loses to me, loses me, and I guess that's just because I'm not a, as big into that kind of pop punky sound as some other people on here. But I did still enjoy this record. It is worth your time if you like that stuff, and better yet, watch our whole video on it if you like that. And stuff. thank you for everyone that has. That was an episode we did not expect to do very well. That quickly became one of our best performing discography videos. That's at like 330 views already. Like, mm -hmm. damn! Thank you all. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. proud of that one. That was yeah and it's actually one of the rare discography videos where despite like absolutely you know speed running the discography multiple times 
to prepare for it. I still wanted to keep listening to those albums after we'd recorded and released it, just because they kept sort of sticking in my head. Uh, gotta talk about a group who I know some members of this podcast are big into. Uh, one, uh, Come Pro, the uh, porn star electronica group. What? I'm what sorry. The... the name is the name is Come Pro. Uh, oh, yes, Come Pro. And and I still don't know what we're talking about. Uh, no, but Ski Mask is the group we're talking about, and their album Come Pro. Uh, I, I do quite enjoy one ski mask. I think Compro is a fairly good, uh, good record. I, I think just, uh, the production here is very good. The, uh, a lot of the beats are very easy to sink into. It's a, it's just a great, great album, both to listen to actively and passively. And, And I did also listen to pool in its entirety, which, is much more of an unruly kind of messy record that I think has a fair number more flops on it than uh, Compro does. But it is also, I think just for the scope and ambition of it, worth your time. It's a weird, unruly, kind of naughty mess of a record. And it's it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Both of those albums, I, I know I had been meaning to listen to them in full properly for a while now. I had heard ski masks uh compro before but gave it a real couple real listens and i i'm in lockstep with it yeah it's pretty good fuck yeah i'm glad you dug pool as well or at least the, even that you just listened to it considering how long it is that, the, i i unequivocally adore that record um both of those albums are like i've listened to them a lot while like playing video games and just kind of like and even doing work as well they're very very immersive yeah. ambient techno right. records it, it helped that I had a 30 minute video to edit. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah. So I just go basically have, yeah, go watch the Common Writer O's videos. Even yes. if you don't watch Common Writer or won't get any of what I'm talking about, I spent like I, way I too have long. no idea what Common Writer O's is, but I've been watching those videos being like, <laughs> that's bad. My final thing, though, for this segment is I want to talk about a band called uh, Built to Spill. Uh, Not because I listened to a new album of theirs in particular, but rather because I saw them in concert. This was it was good time. Doug Marsh's voice is very clearly aged many years since the recording of a lot of those classic songs. And, And I guess my main note is they sound amazing. The bassist is just having the most fun of any person in the world because she's like (laughs) singing along to all of the songs away from the mic because she just, you can tell she knows everything so well by heart. It's really cute. The drummer there, she's also phenomenal. Douglas, of course, has is a virtuoso of the guitar, so that just sounds cool. And really what you're hoping to hear are like those mid 2000s late 90s songs because those are the ones where you can clearly tell because they've had them in their live rotation for long enough they can just basically do whatever they want with those songs and make it sound cool where i think the newer stuff especially the singles from the new album are played a lot safer where it's just like we got to hit all the notes and then we're done versus being a little more adventurous and and kind of just creating a crazy solo in advance or on the spot speaking of which doug marsh featured in our underrated guitar solos video specifically yeah. his solo in velvet waltz which is one of my favorite solos ever so go check that out if you haven't already unfortunately not a song they played no that doesn't <laughs> no, surprise but... me too much no it's, it's probably really demanding did they play did they play going against your mind by any chance yes they did that was the encore yeah that that yes i I remember that that was awesome yeah in terms of what i've been listening to i'll shout a few things out very briefly so one thing that i'm surprised that august didn't shout out but maybe he was waiting for me to do it who knows is because i know that we both listened to this record this week and we both had an incredibly positive reaction to this record. Uh, uh, yet again, we have been recommended some hot shit 
hot, awesome fucking metal music from our friend Connor. Like, like uh, Connor, Connor's uh, the kind of guy who recommends like top quality shit to like people with a scat fetish. He's he he <laughs> knows he knows he the the. the I'm sorry, Connor. Next I believe this is called outing. Mixed metaphors. Outing you you know where I live. Kick my ass oh, if you wait, want. Only to. outing if it's true. Don't sell the man up the river. Now listen, listen. I wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you breaking my balls for? Connor has great taste in metal. Uh, he's been on the podcast many times. He will because he the met all his friends in prison. That's a true fact. <laughs> anyway, he recommended <laughs> that we listen to a record called The Satellite Years by the band Hopes Fall. This is a metalcore, post-hardcore band. And this record is one of the legendary Connor 10 metalcore albums. And I know August and I both listened to it this week and we both had we did. very, yes. very positive reactions to it. Uh, this fucking album is insane. Like this shit is like it is post hardcore. It's metalcore. It's got tinges of space rock in there, even slight tinges of like more aggressive emo in there to a certain extent there's, as well. And I mean, there's also like some light, like electronica splashed in there occasionally. And it's sometimes awesome. it can get vaguely progressive too. It's like everything that this podcast would want in a fucking metalcore record. It does all of these things, by the way, and it's 39 minutes long. It's just fucking, just, it's fucking refined to the nth degree. This thing was an instant fucking nine on the first listen from me. I, and I actually ran it back as soon as it was over to listen to it again because it was that fucking good uh, songs like waitress deeded magazines decoys like curves the bending it, this is oh an God. album that's so like, good that even the fucking instrumental interlude gets like the same rating from me as like full-fledged like songs that are fucking uh, like the interludes are just heavenly and then it pummel it kicks the shit out of you like it's uh, so specifically fun. when i was listening to this actually it doesn't really sound that much like it although it kind of does um but when i was listening to it like the, the interlude redshift it reminded me of uh irresistible by deaf heaven um so and the sunbather enjoyers in this chat will know exactly what i mean the vibe is exactly the same especially in the way that it's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. And then like immediately when it's over, you go back into the heart as fucking loudest screaming shit ever. Um, but it's actually First like the Chad sunbather enjoyer. Yeah. I mean, it's in true cult. It's actually like, I say it's, it's fucking insane, but it's not that unapproachable. It's a very easy record to I, enjoy. I mean, it's insane in the fact that it is balls to the wall fun. Yeah, and it, it it sounds immaculate. Like fucking, this is a podcore record. All that needs to happen is that Jake and Morgan just need to hear it, and they all agree. Yeah, it's, it's, this I is been true. In my library for months. Yeah, if, if you don't like it, uh, that's your problem. <laughs> anyway, that is how that works. Uh huh. Anyway, Indeed. yeah, I cannot recommend that enough. That album is amazing. I just completely just it was the exactly what I fucking needed because it's been. I was, it's been so long since I've like had a first listen that I've just fully just fucking adored all the way through. Like I actually can't, I don't know, actually the new Everything Everything album, I guess. And that feels like it was a month ago already. But so that was like a, a something I really fucking needed. But um, I'll also shout out that I have been going back through, this is something I did in preparation for my ambient video, which I put out a week ago as well on ambient records that I recommend. Although I didn't include this artist in the video because, well, though I was very close to doing that, but I think a lot of their music veers too much in the direction of glitch as opposed to ambient that it doesn't feel like quite the right fit for the video, but it wasn't a comment on quality at all because this has become to be one of my favorite artists. And I've, I'm, of course, talking about the Austrian electronic artist Fenez, uh, whose records I have always been, particularly his album, Endless Summer. Billy which, Eilish's brother? I'll see myself out. Particularly his album, Endless <laughs> Summer, which I this week decided to put into my top 10 albums of all time list, uh, because that album is one of those things where I've come back to it a few times every two or three months, and it's just 
steamrolled me. It's like it's like it's like what that listening to that album is like watching VHS tapes of your dreams and like dying at the same time. Like it, it makes you want to like write the most dead baby on an IMAX review you've ever written in your life because it's just the kind of album that inspires that kind of like uh, incredibly visual sort of synesthetic response. But all of Finez's records are great. Uh, Venice, I revisited this week. An amazing, amazing record that kind of builds on a lot of the sonic aspects of Endless Summer as well. Highly recommend that. Uh, Black Sea and um, is a great record to a very dark, glitchy record. But I also gave a listen to Finez's most recent record, Agora, from 2019, which is actually a much more a much less glitchy and much more droney ambient record that I highly recommend for really strong pieces across 47 minutes, uh, a really, really solid record. So I've really been digging that um, and enjoying that a lot. I listened to uh, the new Wilco album, Cruel Country. Uh, Wilco, oh, a yeah. band that I have a very strong affinity for and a very much a band who I think for about 10 years now I have kind of just stopped making records to like that that anyone who's not already into Wilco will really like have I any thought shot. they were a band with like four albums and then checked the rim page and was like oh it, it, no <laughs> no <laughs> never mind they've been really consistently putting out like uh really solid records but if you're not like super in the bag for Wilco I think that anything after 2011's The Whole Love will kind of which is a great, very underrated album, will kind of most likely fall flat for you. But I think that the new album, Cruel Country, is probably the best record they've put out since The Whole Love. Uh, it sees them very much indulging this current aesthetic of quite sort of low-key alt-country to its nth degree, because this is an 80-minute album, 21 songs. It's just kind of like no editing whatsoever let's just put every oh, fucking song on the album that. and look the vibes were good it passed the vibe check i very much enjoyed it there is very little on here that stands out among the best wilco songs although the tracks bear without a tail and base my skull and many worlds which are the, like the the seven minute tracks here uh were definite standouts for sure and there are some other tracks that I enjoyed very well. Like it's a very consistent, solid six out of 10 record, but like six out of 10 in a very positive sense. Like there's nothing on this record that feels like regrettable or poorly conceived in any way. It's all very solid stuff. And if you enjoy Wilco, you will agree, or you might even enjoy it more than me. But yeah, we were never, ever, ever going to review an 80-minute Wilco record on this podcast, so I wanted to give it a shout-out regardless. And I will also say, just the last thing I'll shout-out, is that I have been revisiting much of the Pearl Jam discography uh, just for out-of-personal reasons, because I love a lot of Pearl Jam records, and I particularly love that mid... We actually, our last record club was on Vitality, so that, I suppose, was what set it off. But I think that their mid period of records between No, Co no Code and Riot Act inclusive are albums that just don't get talked about enough. And I will particularly shout out the album Binaural, uh, which is the album they put out in uh, 2000. I believe that was their sixth record. Um, and look, I think a lot of the post Vitality Pro Jam records get shouted out by Defenders as like, you know, a lot better than the reputation might suggest but still sort of below the tier of their best stuff and i'm here to say that's fucking bullshit binaural is fucking great from front to back it starts off weirdly enough with some of the more inessential songs like three two minute tracks they're pretty good but they're not like you know amazing but then you get to light years the fourth song here and it just hits this prime level of amazing fucking gorgeous Pearl Jam shit and I'm there for the rest of the album uh it, it is more low-key so it is definitely like if you're looking for the raucous intensity of something like Vitalogy you're mostly not going to get that 
But the thing you do get with Binaural that comes back into its title and its unique production style is that this is one of the most beautiful and lush and just gorgeously mixed and produced albums to come from any band remotely adjacent to grunge. Like this is absolutely textually blissful, like all the way through. It sounds fantastic. Uh, and, and I have, it has leapfrogged its way into my top three Pearl Jam records, uh, just behind, of course, 10 and Vitalogy, that it's uh, an album that I love more and more each time I revisit it. Uh, and I also, you know, took the opportunity as well to revisit Riot Act as well, which still holds up. It's definitely an album that is baggy and has some a, a considerably weaker second half than its first half although that second half does have some very underrated songs on it songs like a uh, half full which is a really great uh deep cut you are as well uh, all or none the closer i thought was excellent too um help help uh thumbing my way of course although that's kind of in the first half but that's a really underrated song i know morgan loves that one as well but yeah uh riot act really underrated album deserves more love i'm going to continue diving through the late era pearl jam stuff uh i've just been really enjoying um laying back and vibing to that sort of that that those records and yeah and that's basically been my week so without further ado let's get into our first main review of the episode which is of course Post Malone, 12 carat toothache. So, I mean, where to begin with Post Malone? Where indeed? Post Malone is, I mean, I can't think of a better bit than the one that Jake, Jake opened this episode with about how he's the, the forgotten, you know, parallel universe suicide squad, you know, killed in the first five minutes, motherfucker. I believe it was Todd in the shadows who said he is, he didn't want to make fun of him because he's just such an easy target walking around with a visible pig pen style cloud of filth following him wherever he goes. I mean, here's, here's, here's a man who has chosen to now look, I get that we are so like far removed from the, this particular culture of pop hip hop where it's you know uh fat white dudes who are just covered in in just asinine tattoos and yeah as you say walk around with a cloud of filth and make the most kind of bottom of the barrel shit and somehow have like the <laughs> this crooning voice that people love and look post malone let, let me get this off the bat Post Malone is vocally talented. He's definitely, you know, compared to some of his, uh, you know, his contemporaries, people like Lil Peep and 6 9 and whoever you want to think about and, and bring up, oh, he God. definitely has like a vocal presence that is more tuneful. That said, I can't fucking stand his voice all the same. <laughs> He's fucking, it grates on me so much. It doesn't help that... <laughs> he does still choose to coat it in the most kind of like sin just oily synthetic effects and again we're not for people who may be new joining us we are not like you know mur, mur, mumble rap mur, mur, auto tune people we're not you know that kind those kinds of uh, music consumers no very- we 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 recognize the benefits of mumble rap uh, no, well, what, more than that is that we like and we encourage like people who push the boundaries of you know doing interesting things sonically and and no thing- abs- absolutely like i mean mumble rap has has prevented us from experiencing so many white rappers it well, that's he, a good thing here's the thing to be clear post malone is not a mumble rapper he is very much kind no, of no, graduated exactly. into this class of I guess hard on sleeve uh, singing types now. It, it's like, all it's, about it's the a white break. All like it is. What he's making here functionally, yeah, is basically just pop music with a, a bit of a trap flavoring underneath it. But I think at its core, it is pop music, whether it, you want to call it pop rap or just pop, what what whatever the hell. He Point is being, he's yeah. one of 
many artists who is living in the shadow of the uh, early departed Lil Peep and cashing in on and receiving a, a large amount of commercial success based on the cultural cachet of that particular type of, you know, emo rap adjacent, heavily emotional, crooning, hip hop adjacent sort of pop stuff, R&B adjacent, like it's, it's adjacent to so many things. And yet it's very difficult to define as a single thing. Essentially what this record is, is Post Malone crooning for 45 minutes with some very, you know, low effort verses about how disillusioned he is with his life, but also how uh, much, much affection he has for the, for the special lady in his life. Um, but also the you know the difficulty he has truly trusting a hoe, uh, you know he he, <laughs> he needs that he needs that wife shit he needs a wife he doesn't need a he's also a darker character than we've ever had before that's that's something he makes clear about himself he's he's very I mean, edgy and mysterious you, you can tell from the album cover which is is so dark i mean like it's the the butterflies flying right at the knife in front of that lazy gray gradient where are you going butterfly don't do that po- post- don't do that like- <laughs> post malone said the world is a vampire <laughs> there's a few uh, interesting little kind of tidbits of things to take there away are? from this record like just little things that are funny to comment on i guess oh. i love on the genius page for the album it says rumors about this project began in april 2020 when during the middle of his nirvana tribute concert post announced work had begun on the next album and so that i think tells <laughs> you a lot about the kind of artist that post malone uh. himself as being he is this you know tortured soul who also through his commercial success how cursed it is has suddenly had thrust upon him the title of voice of a generation uh and so he is reckoning with that and commenting on the the lifestyle that the the consider this you might not have ever considered this that sometimes being famous can be quite an empty and hollow existence when you are surrounded by all of these luxuries that are, you know, and, and as he quotes it at one point, 10 billion hoes, you know, just, holy you know, shit, just completely. That's, what he, are you he saying is, to me? He is He's, tired of sex. Are you fucking telling me that being a successful millionaire and being sad can coexist in one mind you know what are you fucking you know what august i like that you bring up that you invoke that pinkerton song because records like this show me all the ways in which pinkerton has aged so well because that record is like such a tongue-in-cheek like piss take on like you know this the the narrative of the successful rock front man who suddenly like indulges in all the drugs and sex and becomes this hedonistic vacuum right that record is such a like uh, a tongue-in-cheek like poking fun at that and the reason why that record is aged well is that the the, the stereotype that rivers cuomo is poking fun of on that album has only become like more and more like every single fucking famous hip-hop adjacent pop figure in the 2010s like the drakes yeah. the post malones the has just been that the Rivers Unai- Cuomo has not gone far enough into parody well it's like unironic like every drake post malone all of them are unironically just doing tired of sex except like for real like that's that's it that's the Dra- thing i mean yeah drake had has had his whole like the whole arc of Drake's career recently has been defined by <laughs> I, I want to still be a playboy, but I also got to be a dad. Damn. Well, here's the thing. I, right? I, I'm like, surrounded by strippers, but I want I want me a real girlfriend. Well, here's the thing, right? So Drake and uh, particularly Logic, I guess, Drake hasn't kind of really made it into his dad era, but he's definitely certified lover boy was definitely like the first big step towards that. And then logic, he, logic. He's, he's kind of in the phase of like having to confront that transition more yeah, so than logic exactly. who's just there 
Whereas Post Malone, oh, as I think he says concerned. on this record at one point, is like he's thoroughly still in his bachelor's era. But he's in like that stage of his bachelor's era, like where Drake's been approaching, where you've been in it for so long that people are starting to wonder what's wrong with you and like you know like like what th- there must be something up like that he the can't point where you discover around. that you're not a bachelor that you actually just have a personality disorder yeah and so post malone i guess is confronting that to some extent on this record and look one thing i'll say i'll give him some degree of self-awareness to a certain extent like i i actually think that the record starts off reasonably all right with the opening track reputation like i think the issue with the album is that he kind of gets forthright on reputation and he gives himself like it's a kind of a really genuinely emotional song and it has a quite committed performance the problem is that he then tries to do the same thing for the length of an entire album and it's the kind of thing that he can get a a solid four minute single song out of but when he tries to do the same bit for the entire record it's just it it, it, not only is it recycling this single idea it's actually stripping away the sincerity and and like the gravity of it because it's making it trivial by doing it again and again and again and again and again if you take a song like reputation and just take it in a vacuum i think this is a good song i think that the as i said there's a committed vocal performance here there's some genuine like you know barbs that he throws at himself it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit woe is me in a way that I think can take it a little too far. And the the obvious kind of Nirvana interpolation with the, you're the superstar, you know, Tainas line is like a little bit like, uh, but you know, it's, it's a decent track. I think that I get the vibe here. Uh, and then Cooped Up is like, it's not terrible. It's, it's kind of like, you know, he's commenting on the, the obvious state of, of being an artist and working in the pandemic and then feeling kind of restricted and, you know, losing time and the, the hollowness of the lifestyle, catching up with them, yada, 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 yada. And that's basically the point at which the album exhausts any, you know, interesting insights about, you know, Post Malone's existence. Uh, and it's also the moment where the album exhausts anything really approaching a interesting musical idea i'll actually jump a second to the big single associated with this record which is actually shoved way in the back end the song one right now with the weekend uh which was i actually have heard multiple times uh it's a song that's been pretty reason it came out actually i think six or seven months ago i remember hearing it last year and it was just a radio thing and it's it's fucking just I want to say it's fine, but it's so fucking <sighs> unsavory. Like it, it brings out like the the one thing I'll say, and this is the most ha- horrible, harsh condemnation I can give this song, is that the weekend is a perfect choice for it because it. it, it <laughs> that's, that's the fucking thing is that you get a taste of it's just like oh hey the guy that's good at doing this. Well, oh, yeah, but also like it's the weekend doing his 2013 to 2015 era. I'm a fucking scumbag who's going to fuck you over and I don't trust you because you fuck another man type of shit. Like it's the it's the brand of the weekend that I like the least. Uh, it's and, okay. and call, call it what it is though I'm just gonna say it I find the misogyny refreshing at this point <laughs> on the album you've endured so much of this same mopey this... white boy shit for so yeah. long that the weekend comes on here and it's just like I suck and you're just like oh thank god I mean my, my, my to, to add god. to the nice to add to the white mope I mean this has a, a fleet foxes feature on it which uh <laughs> Look, it, I have no idea how. I mean, money, yes, money, but I don't know why this happened. Well, apparently, it's such a okay. Yes, uh, Posty has said that he is a big Fleet Foxes fan and has listened to every Fleet Foxes song. <laughs> so good for him. Good for him on that. I've um, listened to every everything everything song. This makes me <laughs> supremely powerful. My uh, dick is ten inches long. You know, uh, Post Malone and Robin Picknold of Fleet Foxes actually performed this on SNL. 
Uh, and I will say that oh, uh, the song, which is called Love It'll be the hate, funniest thing on SNL in the last couple of years. The song, which is called Love, Hate, Letter to Alcohol, is like, I'll say the Fleet Fox's inclusion is tasteful, right? It's minimal. It's basically just harmonies. And it's it's fine. It's whatever. It's the best thing about the song is just getting to hear you know, the proper... I think that's exactly the thing that most if not all of the features just cap out as fine at fine like i never feel like anyone he's bringing on here is is some necessary choice who's like elevating the song this extra degree it's just like yep that's who you would put on this song and, and maybe yeah there's that bizarre Sometimes fleet fox kid Leroy whose voice just sounds like fucking garbage like it does on <laughs> the sound why does anyone find this dude compelling i fucking hate this guy's voice Boy. it's slathered in auto-tune on every single song he's on and it sounds it sounds disgusting we the and we've got the and this chlamydia. album this album actually contains uh the first musical anti-meme something that erases itself from your memory after hearing it, because I cannot remember a single thing about Gunna's feature on this. That, uh, that... Okay. Dude, look, I didn't remember that Robin Pecknold was on this. Look, look, look. Okay. So here's where I want to get to some of the funniest aspects of this record, which is actually, well, let's start with the Gunna track because the Gunna song has, I think the funniest song title I've heard in, Oh God. I cannot be a sadder song like no 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 not just that i cannot be parentheses you're right parentheses song. a sadder song i cannot be a sadder song of course immediately preceded by i like you parentheses a happier song he's really like playing on the uh, freudian dichotomy of man like so here we happiness have- <laughs> sadness here we have the dichotomy of post malone the 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 bipolarness of post malone at one moment he and so i I like you which is the song with doja cat has like is the song i was trying to think of when i think about like the shallowness of how post malone talks about like his you know emotional needs on this record where like you know he's fucked so many bitches and he's he's listless and he's riddled with ennui and he needs like the real girl to to like ground him like that's what he says right I need a good, I, I, now that I'm famous, I got hoes all around me, but I need a good girl. I need someone to ground me. And of course, the good girl in question is the, the hip hop industry's most level headed and uh, grounded and absolutely unequivocally uncontroversial figure, Miss Doja Cat herself, who is Miss Bitch, I'm a cow herself who is perhaps the most intimidating woman in hip hop right now. A uh, respect to her though. She's great. She's a great artist, but she's a very funny choice of a feature she to have on a song like this. She would also kill Post Malone without hesitation. Yeah. She yeah, she has that 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 teeth pussy. Um anyway, I'm not <laughs> said that. Anyway, you're going to have to apologize to her on Twitter for that. Okay. Anyway, that's a, so- that's a throwback to something that happened in real life. Comment if you know what I'm talking about. Send me an email at I don't give a shit at fuckyouasshole.com if you know what I'm talking about. Reblog <laughs> this on Facebook, Twitter, uh, MySpace. Reblog on Facebook. Yeah. I cannot be a sadder song is the, dichot- is the other di- dichotomy, right? So it's like the first one is I need, I desperately need someone to ground me and then this is you're you're fucking suffocating me i need you to get out of my life like this is the and this is the thing like i'm not i'm not denying the reality of the existence of someone who has intimacy issues but and trust issues because of betrayal but also needs to be loved because that's a real thing right but i have no sympathy for post malone who has who tries to be so sincere and then drops lines like you told me you'd protect my heart you'd be my goalie oh god oh, man uh, i hate that line man i don't think so 
<laughs> what you want to do is tell me off. What you want to do is fuck me up. What you're not going to do is top me off. So excuse me for an hour while I love myself. Actually, that kind of I need a good girl, but also women are was evil. was that a was that a reference and... to gasoline topping you off? I I believe it's a I it's thought a it just meant that sloppy toppy. Post Malone. I, I mean Doesn't I know what that I know anymore. that's what he's saying, but I'm gonna believe he's referencing <laughs> drinking gasoline. Well, he also has a song on here called Euthanasia, where oh, he, yes. he talks about my favorite Megadeth album, where he talks about taking a fucking sip from his ash can and spitting another tooth in the trash can. So look, it's the most played out, you know, sort of bog standard fucking emo shit. Have you ever listened to a song by Kurt Cobain? Well, yeah, and this is where I was going to bring up like how obviously influential like doing that that Nirvana tribute concert has been on him. But look, we've uh, I'm stunned. Post, Post Malone, the kind of guy to call Kurt Cobain, Kirk Cobain. Um, <laughs> Not even going to try to dissect that. Post Malone, the kind of the kind of motherfucker to find out about the Kurt Cobain was trans people, and they'd be like, "Yo, love is love. I would hit or some shit. I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> Real talk. Anyway, I, I'm stunned that none of us have. I mean, maybe I just haven't given anyone the chance to yet. But we've talked. I was about, about to fucking say. I was like, well, we, we've talked around. We talked about this album, and we've still not yet brought up the funniest example of how terrible Post Malone is as a songwriter on here. And I'm sure you will know what I mean, uh, because if you've listened to this album with even a vague level of awareness while listening you absolutely would have pick, picked up on some of the the absolutely flatlining metaphorical language of lemon tree the third track uh, on this album uh, lemon uh, tree is is the most well-written song ever it's look, uh it, you know i i always assumed he was English a melon class. look look sometimes you just got to be real right and you've got to understand that some people got an apple some people got a tangerine look around and all i see is people happy with what they're given life is pretty sweet i'm told i guess i'm shit out of luck growing a lemon tree oh it, it's just it needs to, i i need i feel the need to preface this discussion in particular with the fact that this no matter how dumb any of the lyrics we're about to read off are i like the worst thing about this song it's purely just the way his voice sounds. Thank it's, you. It's fucking the fucking Jesus. It's that auto tune effect thing where it has that like trilling quality. Yeah, that. Oh you know when his voice breaks and the auto tune is on it, it's the worst sound ever. Oh, oh and then God. and during Ugh. the chorus, it just sounds horrendous. And Awful. and that chorus would... is also like, I relate to every villain in every film I see. And it's, it's and every dumbest. film I watch, I'm on the side of the bad guy. This oh, motherfucker that's watched the Joker and was just like, "Yo, you know what? This is- I would, I would, I would rather watch like ten hour long compilations of bad American Idol auditions before ever listening to this song this, again. This man could watch like a, a show for like literal baby toddlers where the villain is like some malevolent mustache twirling guy who's just trying to pollute the environment. <laughs> and he'd be like, I'm with that guy. He, he's just like, he's so, he's so in his own feelings. He's just like, yo, I relate to Captain Planet villains. I relate yeah. to the smog <laughs> monster. Emperor Zerg, the boy. <laughs> Ah, oh, mm, hell yeah! <laughs> you know Shit, what, bro? You ever watch Caillou? That bald-headed <laughs> fucker was my hero. If you're gonna uh, do, Caillou. if you're gonna do, Caillou a, is the villain of Caillou. He it's is true. objectively. <laughs> if you're gonna do an emo rap song called Lemon Tree about how sad you are and shit, and using this, evoking this kind of citrus fruit metaphor, then at the very least you could like sample the lemon song by Led Zeppelin or something uh, like you know like you should at least sample like the Simpsons or something <laughs> like that uh the Shelbyville episode like come on that's that's teeing itself up for you right there you got 
you got good samples, you got good ideas if you want to make this not the most generic thing ever, but it is, um, and it sucks. And the goal of this man to then title a track uh, after a cranberries lyric with wrapped around your finger. Like, uh. <laughs> the fact that this song made me think of Linger because of the title while listening to it made me genuinely rich. Probably one of the songs on the album I, I hate listening to the least, frankly, just because when the album decides to be like a little bit oh, more up tempo, no, I can sure. tolerate that shit a little bit more. Like the best thing this album has going for it is the fact that every song on here is a digestible length of time. Like it's like three minutes, two and a half minutes, like nothing. The album itself feels like it ages you but the songs in and of themselves don't feel like they last an eternity it's, so i it's, mean that's yeah it's it's death thing. by a thousand cuts really it's, it's worth just noting like, that you have to keep listening to songs it's worth noting that this is post malone's shortest record and i don't think it's a case of exercising restraint as much as it is as it is as again simply not having any ideas like even his last I record mean, like hollywood's bleeding which I'm so glad it came out before the Jam and Tea podcast was a thing. I mean, at least that there was some variation. Well, I'm actually not because if that had come out, if we were doing the show when that come out, we wouldn't be sitting here reviewing this. That's true. and I would have never <laughs> listened to this album. Morgan would have like gone and shot up someplace. I would be dead. Uh, Riley would be like still in the middle of reading an analysis of just how bad it is. And August, I don't know what the fuck you'd be doing. Like, I, I don't really <laughs> get right I, there, Morgan. I would, uh, a wild card. <laughs> I'm, at, uh, I'm at the fucking Whole Foods blowing shit up in front of us. So you're just, you know, this, this, the 14th track on this. And then that's the song, and then there's the song (laughs) Hollywood's Bleeding. This song is total garbage. Morgan Morgan becoming the 80th time Mitch McConnell apologizes uh, incorrectly for for gun control. The reason I'm glad we didn't review that is because it means that uh, it would have meant that I would have had to justify my stinking hot take that Circles is one of the most overrated pop songs of the fucking last 10 years. And now I've just, yeah. And now I've said well, that. Now but you, because now we're you can not re- justify it in the comments. Well, now, now I can say that. And because we're not reviewing it, I don't have to justify it except to say that I never want to hear that fucking song again in my life. It's like, if you feel the need to run down in our comments and type up some kind of explanation or justification for this Post Malone song like like uh, look the thing is like i agree with you jake that wrapped around your finger is one of the better songs here or one of the more tolerable songs here but it's also a song where he refers to having 10 billion cuties that think he's the man and i would just want oh, to I, I just want to put out and defend the lyricism <laughs> here I, I just want to put out a message here to every single not even just hip human being never ever 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 do i want to ever hear anyone use the word cuties in any context it's ever I just, again I just think it's the tiny bitches, little oranges. that's what i was thinking of too it's, it's yeah. the most unsettling and unsavory possible word you could use to refer to it's anyone possible to if you're referring to women it is literally impossible to refer to them as cuties without sounding like you are some shade of a pedophile there's no way uh, of getting around it yeah so just yeah and i know I'm, i know that also i have to say i laughed because the lyric is 10 billion cuties which is just more more people than exists on the planet so that may be yeah. <laughs> you know i i think that's just, just that's, browning that's, in oranges that's that's oh, a good God. bit of humor on on mr mr malone's part mr malone and the big steppers um oh my he's, God. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> there's a, the only other song I have anything remotely anything to say on is the song Insane, which I think is the moment on the record where he tries to do like his heartless, where he tries to like just kind of go full on like, yeah, I'm an, I'm I'm off the fucking wagon. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm gonna treat you like shit. 
and and you're you 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 came to me and you pretended to be classy but you're nasty you're going back seat in the back you're going back shit in the back seat uh i'm a bachelor and i'm a bastard uh <laughs> again there's this dichotomy and his lyricism all over this thing here uh i got 20 30 strippers in the sprinter van it's a little cramped to try and teach me how to dance that's actually kind of that made me chuckle but um I mean, like you're you're clamoring for eminem's insane while listening to this well, just because yeah, you're like, they, wow it got, me, it got me thinking about artists who like you know the, the most deranged and like actively terrible artists who at least at the very least give you more to chew on than what post does discography episode we ever did on eminem i was an apologist for fucking relapse of all records just because it dedicated itself so firmly to its insanity a record that is bad and i don't like but it is still at least able to make me go ew oh god whereas here i'm listening to this and it's just like this doesn't sound edgy. This sounds like styrofoam. Like <laughs> the, maybe maybe the dumbest lyric on this whole record is I want to see something in a short skirt, please. I want to see something in a shirt skirt, please. Oh. What? <laughs> you know, I <laughs> I I really I there are some God's holy name are you blabbering about? <laughs> You know, and I think this this album is is also a, a victim of just like the production sounding terrible. It, it's Thank got that you. same problem that that like Pusha T album had, where it's it is mixed for car stereos because yes, it, it is everything is just blown out and sounds like total shit. And I listened to this in my car just to check this because I was like confident that was the case. And yeah, if you just crank the bass up enough, sure, it sounds vibey. It sounds fine. Uh, it it helps to sand to kind of like reverse sand off the edges. It, it makes it a little sharper, a little harsher. But I, I can't imagine just like going for a walk and listening to these on this album on like headphones because it would you would want your ears would like physically prevent sound from entering them i want because this is so crap i want to pay a special tribute to the the people or person whoever it is that spends their time writing the genius descriptions for songs at the bottom of genius pages like for songs like this where they describe (laughs) what the song is about and it's obvious what it's about but they describe what the song is about in the most kind of eloquent and sort of formal language possible. No, I like, love this. Like you, you have lyrics on a song like When I'm Alone, where it's like, all I wanted was a piece of decent on the side. When we go to bed, she'd be creeping on my side. And then in, in, the, in, in the fucking... Post Malone reckoned then, with his relationship with the opposite sex. Austin, re- Austin expresses regret surrounding infidelity in his previous relationship. In an effort to avoid the blame and make it right, he addresses his past lover in hopes of reconciliation. Using an electric guitar, bass, drums, and his own voice, Austin creates a rushing and chaotic atmosphere. The fast and tempo is an upbeat voice, sound, as if it's a fucking anomaly. The fast tempo and upbeat sound, which continually progresses during the song, portray the fast and reckless life Austin lives, which might explain his poor and rash decisions. <laughs> I'm like, might. I hope he's, for debate. A, I he, hope. he's a more complex character than we've ever had before. He's <laughs> he's very deep. He's the key to all of this. He's the key to all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, August's point about the, the the way this album sounds, at least Post or whoever produces his albums know their audience. And that audience is, uh, I think the best way I can describe what this album is like is that it's the kind of thing that my abusive ex-girlfriend liked to listen to in the car. Oh God, it's um, so true. Again, like little, it's well, okay. See, I'm on to something here. It's because this is if 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 we have to put up with listening to people label thing as toxic, like uh, as a male manipulator music, this is female manipulator music. This is music for middle class suburban urban white girls who have convinced themselves that they have experienced a modicum of sadness in their life they can listen to this and be like oh my god he's so sensitive this is exactly and, who this is for this is and for these, the these people girls. listen to little peep 
these girls all have names like uh, Courtney, Kyler, Kenner, Briley, some, something, uh, uh, <clears throat> some, something That's of that bingo. ilk. We we all know these people. Yeah. Okay, let's um before we turn into the jams and incel podcast, let's turn okay. the dial I down. I draw the line at being vaguely referred to as an incel while talking about a post Malone album. The problem with this album is that it sounds like it's written from the perspective of a 13 year old who's never had sex before. Everybody in the world sucking on my penis, sucking on my penis and I'm giving you diseases. <laughs> Slapping your face all across the galaxy with my big fat dick. Don't get mad at me. I've got the biggest balls you've ever seen. <laughs> living my life is like living a dream. <laughs> that, that's the perfect capstone on the segment favorite tracks i'm shocked ratings. we managed to talk about this for this long honestly i mean this i'm impressed like, i know we saved true. our energy in that one week to really exude this week jake what are your Bali favorite tracks least favorite track in rating uh my favorite track is <laughs> my least favorite track is uh, the most similar album that we've reviewed to this in the past is like the fucking um, pineapple tree album that we that we literally left off of our worst albums of the year list because it was so boring we couldn't say anything about it. Uh, yeah, fucking free. <sighs> uh, like you, Jake, I'm going to completely forego picking tracks in either way positive or negative i'm not i'm not leaving a footprint on this i i'm doing no. nothing of the sort uh hell i like a 3.5 i guess it, whatever who cares <laughs> it it it's like only mildly more interesting than like the new weezer ep oh god it's Fuck. it's it's i don't know what this means, but I think it's comfortably better than the Weezer EP. <laughs> well, I said it was better too. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, mildly. for sure, for sure. It's a, it's a. This is a three, and that's like a two. Yeah. Anyway, Morgan. Uh, um. Uh, I, the, yeah, the the weekend song didn't make me wish that I was not alive. Yeah. Least is the, uh, the the track that made me wish I was not alive the most was uh, Lemon Tree. I'm gonna give this a uh, ever so slightly better than Arcade Fire's We out of ten. Oh, the motherfuckers trying to take me on my Lemon Tree. Um, my three favorite track. Do a lyric from that. My three favorite tracks is How embarrassing reputation cooped up and my least favorite track is lemon tree yeah. <laughs> yeah it's lemon tree i suppose uh my and... favorite track is your reputation look what you made me do and just <laughs> don't look at me like that you know i i i didn't know enough taylor swift songs so i, I was gonna let you do that bit yeah, I should have. Yeah, I should have right. actually just said Reputation and then just named two other songs on Reputation. Post Malone's um, "The Tale of Two Thakes gets three point one out of ten. Yeah, and then we go on the second review of the day, which is of course. Angel Olsen, big time. Which, because I'm the only person who would do this, I keep calling it a big mess in my head because that's the Danny Elfman album from last year. But also because and the last the record she mess. put out was called Whole New Mess. So I've been calling this big mess. Which we did week. talk about, actually. That said, I, now that we're now that we're talking about music that's actually worth talking about and because we smothered him out of the last discussion and he has a vinyl of Angel Olsen behind him. Yeah. I say that we let Morgan introduce this uh, little uh, segment because I know he is a big Angel Olsen fan. Angel Olsen, a noted singer, songwriter, formerly a band member of uh, Bonnie Prince Billy, backing vocalist with, that, with them before breaking out on her own 
with the first album Halfway Home and has been sort of uh, steadily gathering steam throughout the last decade Mm -hmm. uh, and really sort of came into her own with the album My Woman, uh, which was a big critical success and really put her on, on the map. Still, my favorite album of hers, probably. Although it's it's there's tough competition, but that record was, was like that record so defined, like that particular like it was because Southern Hemisphere it came out in spring of 2016 for me, and it would have come out in uh, autumn fall for you guys. But that record just defined like that season that it came out in for me. I spent it so much. It feels like it was omnipresent around that time, or at least just in the circles mm-hmm. we ran in followed it up three years later with the record behind me all mirrors uh which was my favorite of hers and also pretty much a complete left turn from my woman and burn your fire for no witness uh completely into this really expansive lush baroque pop sound and all mirrors there is probably my i will i will call it my favorite non-julia holter baroque pop album really one of my favorite records of 2019 um and I, naturally i was really looking forward to this record as especially as uh, the first singles i can't it was it was all the good times first or was it big yeah. time first uh, all the good times was first and then big time i'm pretty sure yeah yeah well, it was both of those uh sing- singles signified yet another left turn for angel into more of a country americana aesthetic Mm -hmm. approach and i i have to say i really love both of those songs i found them really promising as singles they definitely evoke her inspirations in particular on this album but also feel enhanced by the sort of production she experimented with on all mirrors and have this really huge expansive sound so yeah really strong stuff there and i was i was talking about the record itself i don't think anything on here really gets better than those first two songs i think this is just a pretty good record um but its biggest failing in my mind is a failure to commit to this sound that she's really good at with the first two songs it's sort of a both sonically and somewhat qualitatively uneven album with nothing that i would call even mediocre really it just never really feels holistic i was really excited when i heard those first two singles just because i thought this would be like a straight up americana album and it's not really (laughs) And that's somewhat disappointing in part because the things that are not Americana songs with exceptions feel sort of not really fleshed out in ways that they really should be. So it leaves the album in general in a really weird middle ground place that I I, I feel like I'm being more neg- negative than I really feel here because I think everything on here is at least good. Uh, but it's also... As much as you're enjoying whatever's playing, there's always the lingering feeling that it should be more. One one thing I'll say for this, um, I, I definitely was underwhelmed by it the first time I listened to it, and I have warmed on it somewhat. I think I've just started to slightly understand the pivot here a little bit more. There's an interesting backstory to the conceptualization of this record. A lot of what Angel was writing about after finishing All Mirrors and its um, accompanying side per- side record of alternate versions, Whole New Mess, was her, you know, coming to terms with her sexuality, essentially, as someone who is, you know, a little bit older in her 30s and still trying to figure out who you are at that stage of your life. And so uh, I think in 20, I think last year, uh, she came out uh, officially uh, to the world and to her parents and then unfortunately they part both passed away within two weeks of her doing that 
Uh, and so she only got this very short amount of time that she felt that she could be, you know, her true self with them. And so this record, I think, is in large part preoccupied by Angel coming to terms with being able to fully embrace her sexuality, being in a committed and loving relationship, and also reckoning with past relationships as well. Um, but also like feeling a sort of sense of, of isolation and longing, uh, even though she's happy and uh, trying, I guess, to understand that and come to terms with that. Uh, and it's something that I think comes through somewhat obliquely for the most part. There are moments on the record where it comes through really strongly. Like obviously songs like Big Time are, are just very straightforwardly, you know, love songs to Angel's current partner. And there's a lot of very sort of sweet sentiment on this record that feels like the kind of sweet sentiment that you can only really express in a meaningful way once you've kind of lived a bit and gotten a bit older and, and you're kind of settling into a domestic life with someone that where you've kind of both been through a certain amount together and you both sort of know the world and know yourselves. So a lot of that's coming through uh, in the songwriting here. But yeah, it is a much more sort of stripped back and low key affair compared to something like All Mirrors, which felt like she was deliberately trying to make the most sort of maximal record as possible. Uh, that said, uh, I will say I think that there are some beautiful moments on this record that have really kind of resonated with me. Uh, songs like Ghost On uh, have really stood out to me as just kind of beautiful little plaintive and, and melodically satisfying songs uh, even though they kind of do meander a bit I think particularly the second half of this record has some arrangements that feel like Angel is kind of you know trying to take this new sort of country Americana aesthetic and bring it towards where she used to be with the more sort of like indie and kind of baroque or atmospheric uh, sounds of her last few records and I think that works reasonably well on songs like uh, Right Now and This Is How It Works and Go Home, those three in a row, I think, are, are quite strong. But yeah, overall, it does feel as though it is a bit of a, a record where Angel is trying to testing the waters. Uh, it, does, it doesn't, in retrospect, it seems completely unsurprising that Angel Olsen of all people would make a full-on pivot into country. She has a voice that's suited for it, I think, and just a kind of artistic temperament as well. Uh, a lot of her best music, or a lot of the music that I fell in love with her for off of records like my woman and burn your fire for no witness especially is more low-key is very more sort of stripped back and so it feels like a kind of homecoming for her but also through the lens of this new stage of her life and so I enjoy it I think it is nowhere near the tier of of her best records but I it, it has a comfort in it that her, all mirrors doesn't have because all mirrors is such a sort of tense album uh, and so I, I get a, a certain amount of satisfaction from hearing how comfortable Angel is, even if there is some sort of lingering tragedy in the margins of this thing. I think maybe that if you're not as invested in Angel's trajectory as an artist, this is probably going to do even less for you. Just because I broadly agree with the two of you. I, I, I enjoy it. I, I, in fact, I'd say... I broadly have the same like feelings towards it that I did on the new Sharon Van Etten album, except I like that a little bit more because it was more consistent, but it like hits a high point really, really early and then just never quite hits that same point again. And I will say it's marginally disappointing that I only kind of enjoy this album just because while I would say this does basically trip over the line into being good, it's just all her other canon projects, I think, are great. Like, just capital G, great albums. Like, My Woman is fun and raucous. Burn Your Fire for No Witness is thoughtful and heartbreaking. All Mirrors is, is huge and expansive. And, and this, especially right now, makes a whole lot of sense for her to pivot to just because, I mean, this is like the year of artists pivoting into making folk and Americana stuff. I mean, we got shit like the Big Thief album that has been making rounds of that's like a full on commitment into something that artists like Big Thief had orbited, but never fully like 
stepped into and stuff like Ethel Kane has, you know, been doing really well in terms of like uh, indie alternative music uh, that is, you know, Americana folk tinged as of late. So Angel doing this at the same time sort of feels at peace with a sort of resurgence of music like this. And I guess it's really that the, the, the dedication to that sound is not quite here in its totality, the twang of the guitars on those first couple of songs, and you know the the emphasis on strings is is nice when the songs are going for something a little bit bigger. Like I I just think that you know again the first song on here, all the good times, is just breathtaking, and then the album just does not really ever sound much like that. Occasionally, it'll have some sort of instrumental flavors that are a little bit left of the dial. And, you know, if that's not what she was going for, then that's fine. It would be, you know, it's still a decent folk album, but I can't help but feel like this is just something that feels like an attempt to transition into something else that isn't, that just isn't quite as fully realized as her other pivots. And you know, this doesn't make me any less invested in her as an artist, just because she has been so chameleonic with her other records, and in my opinion, so successful at embodying different kinds of sounds, that it's just kind of inevitable that she's not going to be able to hit every bullseye, because, I mean, fucking, who can? I, I get it. The, 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 the real failing of this album, though, is because I... While the inconsistency in the sound is, you know, definitely a problem for me, it's not something that would, you know, if, if the album is still largely great, I, I would just sort of be like, yeah, that's a problem, but I still broadly love it. But I, I think really it's the, the, the songwriting for uh, roughly about half the album is just kind of not there. I just find the, the sparser tracks here, like All the Flowers or even something like through the fires or or they're just some of the songs on here they're just really scant and the emotionality of something like you know when you listen to my woman or you listen to a song like intern or something there's just there's so many layers and density to not only the sound but to what angel's speaking to a certain flavor of heartbreak or a kind of position that you're in in a relationship that has this you know it, it, complicated dynamic that you have to really go out of your way lyrically to accurately relay and the sort of uncomplicated nature of the lyrics here feel kind of safe uh, it, it's just something that when you have the combination of lack of dedication to sound and the lack of dedication to sort of emotional complexity it just leaves this being a kind of dry re-listening experience where it's just like on half of it you just don't really get much out of the songs it's still again broadly a good album that sounds good and has a compelling central performer i think that the best thing this album has going for it is the fact that angel's vocals have never sounded better her voice when i mean big small intimate large whatever it always sounds fantastic and there are always there are moments on her earlier records where sometimes her vocal refrains are uh, hooks can sound a bit strained or forced, and I don't think that's here at all. Everything sounds really free, everything sounds really loose, really relaxed, really comfortable, and that's awesome. So if she wants to pursue this sound further after this, I'm all for it, just because I think it's in her, just because clearly she's got a couple songs on here that really hit the mark. But that said, if she transitions into something else or revisits an old sound on the next record, I'm really not going to be too heartbroken about it. So it's good. I just I just expect it better. August, how much did this bore you? No, I liked the <laughs> first song a lot. I'll, I'll give it that. Like may, maybe like uh, fuck, I can't even remember what it's called. Um, all the good things. All the good things and the title track. Good times. Uh, Shit, we sorry. Did it for real. Fuck. All the. <laughs> oh my god. All the good times and big time. Really, really hitting us with the time theme. I can't pretend this was terribly it for me. I I guess, yeah, I think a point Jake made about the songwriting just, it almost felt too direct and just immediately digestible to the point where I was like, I, I felt I got everything out of it from just listening to it once. And 100%. when I listened to it to a second time today, I was like, yeah, there's there's just i don't feel a lot here for me 
she's got a pretty voice uh that that helped pretty <laughs> voice woman make pretty sounds one thing i'll um, say that uh just as a kind of i guess summary thing that I, i've heard a few people say who aren't who say they've had difficulty getting into angels music in the past, but this has really clicked with them. So I would suggest maybe if, if that's the case for you, if, if angels sort of brand of, of sort of mopey sort of sad, but very beautiful. Uh, and of course, in the case of all mirrors, much more sort of lush and intense emotional songwriting just isn't really your bag. Then check this out anyway. I think one thing about this record is that it is a record made by someone who is comfortable, right? Who has reached a kind of point where they are enjoying a kind of stability that they feel is hard earned. And yeah, it, it lacks some of the kind of, I guess, emotional high wire acts of some of our previous records, some of the heartbreak, some of the, the grittier aspects of those albums. But uh, if you are looking for a record that is kind of more comforting and more sort of straightforward in that way then this may be for you i think there's definitely something to be said for records like that and i think that uh it serves that purpose reasonably well so yeah i i think that oh, go back and revisit my woman because half the songs on there bang like a motherfucker <laughs> like that's she gets lumped in with like the sort of occasionally weepy sad girl renaissance i know that that's a frowned upon term but that's the best way to immediately put it but like she doesn't really get enough credit for the fact that she's got songs like shut up and kiss me which just fucking rock so yeah. do that too yeah she's also just a little bit older than the kind of sad girl renaissance indie artists i think it's there's always a maturity to angel songwriting that i feel like isn't necessarily in keeping with that sort of wave even though yeah. the sound of her kind of is absolutely absolutely i, I think maturity is a really good word for it um, and not necessarily that the other artists are immature, but just that when you've had more time to live, again, as I said earlier, she has a kind of wizened sensibility and yeah. feel to her when when she when she sings. It's, anyway, it's like easy to forget, sort of that. Yes, uh, burn your fire starts with unfuck the world, which totally fits in with that sort of sad girl renaissance image, and but it's also. You know, if it's followed by Forgiven Forgotten, which is like a fucking Slater Kenny song. Mm. So Yeah. Ooh. You know. Yeah, that album's so fucking good. Um, Yo. alrighty. Well, then let's wrap this one up. Favorite tracks and ratings for Angel Olsen's Big Mess. Uh, I'll go first this time. My three favorite tracks are gonna be well, I know the first two are already gonna get enough love. I'll co-sign, they're fantastic songs, but I'm gonna pick that three song stretch in the middle of the record that i really like of right now this is how it works and my favorite song which is go home uh least favorite on the record for me is probably either all the flowers or dream thing uh they're both about the same uh, and i will give this a positive six out of ten yeah three favorites all the good times the title track and i'll say all the flowers uh, least favorite probably through the fires one of the things that strikes me the least on here um and overall i will give this a seven out of ten so my three favorite tracks on here are uh all the good times uh big time and uh right now isn't bad uh least favorite i i guess uh chasing the sun i didn't care for much i this is a me problem but i i can't stand the word chasing being sung it always sounds like people are saying jason and it's really funny to me <laughs> uh jason. <laughs> jason like if anyone remembers that foo fighters album it, it always sounded like he said <laughs> Jason Birds and it was so funny in this sound. Anyway, uh, it gets like a, I guess a five and a half from me. Uh, my three favorite songs are All the Good Times, Big Time, and <laughs> Jason the Sun. Uh, <laughs> least favorite song is probably probably right now. And I gave the album a six. 
Well, that gives us an average overall of 6.1 for Angel Olsen's Big Time. Let us know at home what you think of either of the records we reviewed today. Have we been too harsh? Have we been too kind? That seems unlikely. Let us know in the comments <laughs> below. If you're listening on uh, Spotify or Apple, you can head on over to the YouTube page by following the link in the description. Leave us a comment there. Leave us a like if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Thanks to all the new subscribers as well. If you're watching too, we've had a bit of an uptick recently, which we're really happy to see. Again, stick around for Tuesday. We'll be back with a record club on Depeche Mode's Songs of Faith and Devotion. And then we'll have our Bureau retrospective episode on Biophilia following that on Thursday. So be here or be square. Uh, be, be here he now. As always, folks, uh, rock over London, rock on Chicago, TED Talk, ideas worth spreading. <laughs>